Mr. Josie Tate, though. Yeah. <laughs> she, was the, she was the first person I really clicked with upon um, moving to LA and, and embarking on this journey. Um, I remember in our orientation, Sarah was walking around the room and was just kind of getting to actually meet us for the first time. And I was talking to her and was like, yeah, I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And from across the room, Josie was like, me too, we're going to be friends. <laughs> and that's what kicked it off initially. Um, I think we both knew from there on out, like we had a solid friendship being complete strangers just because we've come from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. She has felt like a little piece of home since I've been here. And even though she moved back to Wisconsin this year, I have felt so supported by her. Um, I've never met someone with as much um, hometown pride. <laughs> Josie loves Milwaukee and she loves to talk about how much she loves Milwaukee. And that has made me so much more proud to say that I'm a Midwestern too. <laughs> Honestly. And so Josie has not only been immensely easy to connect with, um, but she has been a huge support system for our entire cohort. She always seems to say and do the right thing, even if that's not what you want to hear or it's challenging. She's just, she's so wise and she's so supportive and she's encouraging, she's loving, she's strong and she's very courageous. And I'm very excited for her to share this thesis with you. So please welcome up Josie. even as good as that speech. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. Um, I do really love Milwaukee, um, and I am currently in Milwaukee, changing the world, or actually just a very, very, very small part of Milwaukee, which is a good start. Right? So, my thesis is all about asana, and for those of you who have known me through this program, that is the most obvious thing I could have ever written about. However, I did spend half of this past semester thinking that I was something different or wanted to write about something different until, and this is a true story, uh, my cohort ran an intervention on me <laughs> and I got a conference call, which I didn't even know you could do a cell phone, <laughs> from Los Angeles and they basically told me like, Look, here's your thesis. Let's just let go of that other stuff. So it actually it actually worked. Um, sometimes it just takes the people who know you to kind of show you who you actually are. And I think we've been really lucky to have a cohort who's been willing to do that. To tell you when you don't know yourself what you need. So thank you guys. Let's talk about this stuff. I have been practicing Yogasana since 2003 and teaching since 2012. It's important to explain how yoga came into my life, and it's a very personal story, and thank God everybody else has been telling really personal stories, um, and the development of my practice in order to understand the driving force behind why I chose to explore the physical practice of yoga. For those who know me in this program, like I said, super obvious. I have been a steadfast proponent of this since like day one in this program. And it's not an easy thing to stand behind. So fist to the sky, guys. <laughs> All right. This is my first time using this thing, so. Abby, can you, uh, the floor. Can you run intervention? Yeah. <laughs> you realize you're asking me, right? I'm just gonna like just give you like a little thing when you need to change it. But that's how we have to do it. I can do it. So here's the story. I began practicing as a freshman in college because I was a distance runner and needed a complementary practice to nourish my body and maintain endurance. Easy. So I started with Iyengar, although I had absolutely no patience for it. And I never fully understood what it meant, except precision alignment and a lot of holding poses. 
Yoga didn't mean much to me at the time. And it was just a physical movement style. That's all anything really was to me. Which worked for where I was through my early 20s. I think for a lot of us in our early 20s. I was busy figuring out who I was, where I was going, and what I was going to grow into. I had very little relationship with my body except to push it hard, work it hard, and just trust that it would keep going. Something I think we all falsely believe in our 20s, which is invincibility. My childhood was sadly typical of too large of a percentage of females in America. Physical trauma re resulting in PTSD. I had no interest in feeling things, particularly my body. When I was 24, my dad passed away with little warning, and I ran away to attend a graduate school program on the East Coast. I was writing, running, teaching, and alone. I found a yoga class at the university's gym and began going fairly regularly, and when I was in one of my lowest, most disconnected and disassociated moments at 25, something shifted in my practice. I had a brief moment in which I suddenly felt a very specific targeted muscle light up in a pose that I had never felt before. I had never felt anything so refined and definite in my body before. I remember riding my bike home and trying to stay with that sensation, but it very quickly vanished and in its place was a sudden burst of raw emotion. I went home and cried for the first time since my dad passed away. It was scary and confusing to be opened up in this way, and it honestly took another two years to fully accept a transformative experience and actually begin the process. I had begun to recognize that there was deeply embedded scar tissue beyond the physical plane, but that I had no way of accessing it and deconstructing it without first encountering my body. My body was acting as a shield, suppressing the underlying emotions. My teacher training throughout 2012 unraveled my story. My asana practice became my self-study, a way for me to develop an identity as a moving, breathing, feeling, sentient being. This process was necessary before any further healing would be available. I am a distressing statistic. One in six women in America will experience sexual assault of some kind. One in five girls is sexually abused, according to the National Center for Victims of Crime. But my thesis is not about sexual assault or crime in America. It's about an effective method of healing the trauma that can become deeply embedded within the physical body. In my thesis, I argue that the evolution of yoga in America, however far from its roots traditionalists contend, is an organic response to a culture that necessitates, craves, and so desperately needs to understand the value of the vessels in which we travel through this existence. So many in this country are so extensively disassociated from their bodies, whether it's because of trauma, neglect, diet, lifestyle, ignorance, that there is too large of a majority that can no longer feel anything, physical or emotional. Approaching the physical body before diving headfirst into philosophy and stillness, which is something America doesn't quite understand so well, may be a more beneficial introduction into a practice that is meant to encourage evolution. Iyengar believed that you must first prepare and strengthen the body before you can access the intricacies of the mind and learn to control it. He believed that the body was a necessary vehicle for the spirit and therefore must not be underrated. A soul without a body is like a bird deprived of its power to fly. A quote by Iyengar. Until we learn how to discipline the body we will lack access to the mind and so also to the spirit. This belief underlies most of the westernized appropriation of yoga, which relies heavily on yogasana as its primary method of practice. Although this system was brought to us by some of the foremost instructors of yoga, BKS Iyengar, K. Patabi Joyce, and TKV Desikachar, trained by Krishnamacharya, there are those who attack this methodology as a bastardization and commercialization of yoga. Yes, that is Christy Turlington. <laughs> I mean, yes, that is a white t-shirt. <laughs> Despite these allegations, I remain a steadfast proponent of the postural limb of yoga and its myriad benefits to the average American practitioner. I believe that, particularly in fast-paced, full-scheduled, modern American society, the physical body acts as a more efficient entryway into the deeper philosophical practices of yoga. 
To ignore the body and the present condition of the Western body is to ignore the glaringly obvious macrocosmic reflection of the microcosmic spirit. We must begin with a gross representation and slowly work our way into the intricacies of self. I support the importance of addressing asana first. <laughs> use arrows. I support the importance of addressing asana first in a comprehensive American yoga practice through the lens of Hatha Yoga's evolution from the emergence of the tantric body and encourage the traditionalist attacks on America's body central focus to allow space for the immutability of yoga. I present a timeline of the development of the asana throughout Hatha Yoga's history to address concerns with a rapidly growing list of postures practiced today. And I conclude with a discussion about the body central philosophy of America and the question of negative body image enforcement through such a material approach. In my thesis, I am left to believe that although the exclusive practice of yogasana cannot be considered the ultimate pathway to liberation, it was never meant to replace the other practices, either historically or contemporarily, but merely act as one entry point from which the other possible limbs would emerge. As the modern householder, far more entangled and interwoven with attachments to the physical plane and society, we must accept that our yoga isn't meant for ultimate liberation, but to find some amount of temporary or permanent solace from the suffering of life, a small step in the cycle of rebirth and the shedding of karma. Those proponents that the, believe that the appropriation and westernization of yoga has and is continuing to ruin the practice for the entire world say that our focus on the physical practice has become a capitalistic, fitness-oriented commodity that is a lending factor in ruining body image more than healing it. And although I can definitely look out into my yoga classes and see a sea of expensive name brand yoga gear and neatly organized top buns that are the emblem of commercial yoga these days, I also see a majority of young people who appear to have little or no internal communication between their mind and their body. And most importantly, I am witness to some extraordinary aha moments when that neurological bridge is built and they are suddenly, irrevocably experiencing control over their left foot's arch on earth, or the intense stabilizing connection between the base of their right pointer finger and their shoulder. I understand the fear underlying the arguments against allowing the focus of this ancient practice to be physical, but this practice has never been an immutable force. The tantric, tantrics, in radical response to an oppressive Brahmanical societal structure, sought to reclaim the importance of the body and understood it as divine and essential, one of the true pathways to embodying the divine energy of Shakti. There was an emphasis on cleansing the subtle body, which could be accessed through the physical, in order to awaken it. From the tantric philosophy grew Hatha Yoga, and in the growth of Hatha arose the physical postures in prominence, some of which we still see today. Seated postures form the basis of most yoga poses in the surviving translated text from Hatha. In the 11th century CE, Himachandra's Yoga Shastra presented a pose similar to headstand, according to James Mallinson and Mark Singleton, called Duryodhanasana. In the 14th century CE, the Hatha Yoga Pradipika presented quite a few seated postures alongside Mayarasana, a pose we still practice in modern yoga as an advanced arm balance. The Shiva Samhita in the 15th century CE dropped the number of poses and included only seated postures, and then the Granda Samhita amped up the number of poses considerably to 32 and included headstand and more notably the first standing postures, tree pose and chair pose. This text places special importance on the body as an essential vessel for the spirit necessary to build strength. Chair pose is specifically implemented as a cleansing technique, a very different application than modern yoga, but a radical approach at the time. In the 17th century CE, the text Haratnavali introduced the mystical application of 84 asanas, though only 36 were described, a number that repeats throughout the philosophies quite a bit. It's interesting that in this text, among the many poses listed, Vikasana and Vrishikasana, <coughs> Crow Pose and Forearm Scorpion Pose, are both listed, though it's unclear whether they were similar to the modern-day interpretations. 
The Joga Pradipika in the 18th century CE provided in-depth explanations of all 84 postures and devoted over 30% of its passages to the practice of asana. It was in this text that it's inspired, a hundred years later, pictorial representations of all included asanas, images of which my cohort may remember from James Mallinson's presentation. Those are some of them. Let's jump to the modern era. Yoga hit Hollywood hard in 1947, <laughs> when the infamous Indra Devi made her way to Sunset Boulevard armed with charisma and priceless training under Krishnamacharya. Celebrities flocked to her small studio to practice this newly constructed hatha yoga in search of agelessness. This ideal of the perfected body didn't manifest in America with the arrival of yoga, though. This mindset was long in the making and had reached a point of socio-political culmination at that time through the introduction of Kennedy's physical fitness program in 1961. The program was developed in response to a post-war trend in sedentary lifestyle with the rise of television and the fall of the farming industry due to mechanization. There was a health crisis on America's hands and <laughs> movement was a solution. Yoga was no exception, and it was commercially successful. Hatha grew into what we recognize today as vinyasa flow, and most Hatha classes, labeled as thus, are more in line with vinyasa than any other style. Looking through the history of Yogasana, particularly through the lens of the emergence of Hatha, there is no single line that can be drawn from start to finish to discern some ancient lineage that is still practiced and taught today. But yoga, in whatever form it is found, is meant to design an end to suffering for its practitioner. Even if Americans are only stepping onto their Lululemon yoga mats with their tight pants and top buns for 60 minutes out of the week, that 60 minutes can mean the difference between endless suffering and temporary relief. Through a practice that offers the ability to truly connect with, understand, appreciate, and gain control of the physical body, the doorway to a much deeper journey can be opened, one that holds space for the philosophies of the self. The microcosmic universe beneath the steadfast sheath of the body. Somebody has questions. Yes. <laughs> um, what's your favorite posture? <laughs> uh, the answer when I was 20 is very different than the answer from when I was 30, and the answer to that today is probably, oh man, I just, we're finishing a graduate program, so like, Shavasana. <laughs> <laughs> I think it evolves, though. I mean, the, the really great thing about the asana practice is that as we also evolve throughout our lives, from our teens to our 20s to our 30s to our 40s to our 60s, our physical practice changes alongside and it evolves alongside where our bodies are. And that's exactly what yoga should be doing over the long span of history as well as in our individual lives. Yes? Well, I, I have more of a comment, but I very much appreciated this thesis and presentation because as my cohort knows, I used to hate yoga and I kept going, like asana practice, and I was like, this is boring, why do we do the same thing every time? And it became like, you know, now I know it's a sun salutation. Um, but, it, but I agree with you that it's a stepping stone and now I'm here and it led me to a lot of other avenues, and maybe it does for some people and doesn't. So, I appreciate your focus on this limb because it is a way for people, you know, to be. It sure is. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Abby. <laughs> um, so, um, you're the asana chick, the posture <laughs> chick. How has um, your academic scholarship changed the way you teach? Mm. I was really hoping no one would ask me that. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, just like the fluctuations of my mind, it has been very fluctuating throughout this program. Um, 
some of us lack because if you've been in the program, you know that for probably the first year, nobody practiced anymore because <laughs> we were so stressed out. Uh, but as you sort of make your way back to the practice, Man, that is a deep question that I could maybe talk about for like 20 minutes of just blabbering on and, and finally end up with some kind of coherent response, but I don't know how it has informed my teaching or my practice yet, and thank you Dermot for telling me it's okay to say I don't know, um, because I really don't, I, I think I need time and separation to allow this program and the philosophies to sink in a little bit deeper, you know, like we feel the asana practice down to our bones and in, in like our neurological system and in our muscles and in our brains and these things all are interconnected and it's a lot to take in, it's overwhelming for this stuff to sink in and sometimes you just need like a hot minute to do it. So I need a hot minute. <laughs> Alba. Well, first, thank you. I really enjoy your presentation. And um, I wanted to ask you because today, as I was getting many of the books to bring them back to the library after uh, we are almost at the end, many of those books I didn't have the chance to read, and they were about your topic, about modern yoga and how it has changed in America. So I was wondering if there is any particular book or author that you have used more in your thesis or that that it, it has um, that you have liked more because there are many of them. There are. There's a lot, like a lot. <laughs> yeah. a actually, a surprising amount considering I think a lot of the philosophies are sort of. Um, I, I, I'm going to say it. A lot of philosophies and writers out there, even modern, are against where the asana practice is going, but. I managed to find a lot of really great resources that are sort of proponents of the practice. And I can, I'll give you a list of authors and stuff. I had like eight pages of resources, so there's a, a surprising amount out there. Richard Rosen is an amazing contemporary human being in general, and he doesn't, I listen to a lot of podcasts of him. <coughs> And that's the first time I've ever been able to say that I listen to podcasts and have it be true. This is a new thing for me. Um, but he's just so eloquent and, and he actually understands asana on a philosophical as well as an anatomical level. So anything you can find by him, and I know we read one of his books in the program, is just great. It's amazing. He just came out with a new book. So... Appreciating that you love Milwaukee, <laughs> <laughs> and also thinking about the city where so many people have, you know, are experiencing, you know, racial trauma and all kinds of intersectional trauma, and we spoke about changing the world in one small way at a time. So can you describe some of the ways that your practice and your willingness to help change the world will connect with the difficult places in the city? I am glad you asked about Milwaukee, because let me talk about Milwaukee. <laughs> um, so, a great thing that happened today is that I signed my small business loan papers to... Yeah. And I'm opening up my own yoga studio in Milwaukee, and I'm doing it in a neighbor neighborhood that sort of stands on the border between the gentrification that is happening in Milwaukee and then what is still very much the underserved neighborhoods of Milwaukee. And it's like right on the border. And I've come into contact with a lot of really great teachers and what I want to do is I want to get some of the teachers who are actually in, living in and communicating with and interacting within those neighborhoods into my studio so we can start to be the fact that the studio is like right on the edge of both sides I want to get communication between people and if you guys I'm not going nobody here probably really knows Milwaukee except for me and Bria but it is the number one most segregated city in the entire nation and it's long held that position for I mean probably decades we're not doing well with that 
but it's also like the top fifth most poverty stricken city in the nation. So it has its problems. And one of the biggest problems is that we don't have neighborhoods talking to each other. We have them fighting with each other. And we have one side of the argument pushing the other one out, as a lot of urban areas are doing with gentrification and stuff. And we need to develop these safe spaces where there can be a conversation, where we can have a dialogue about stopping this war against each other and understanding that we are human. And one of the best ways to do that is to heal the traumas that are occurring on both sides of that argument. And that's what yoga is there for. Yoga is there for bringing us into contact with ourselves and understanding that if we come into contact with ourselves, we're in contact with everyone around us too. And hopefully, hopefully, this starts that dialogue. Awesome. Where is it? Woo! <laughs>